Welcome to this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast, episode 758. I'm your host, Surreal Gerald Quinn, on this 8th of February, 2021. Hope everybody enjoyed their weekend. Uh, you know, certain places, especially in the East Coast, we had some snow, especially in the Northeast. Uh, we didn't, you know, DMV didn't get touched up for that much, man, like a quarter of an inch, it seemed like. Um, so, hope everybody out there enjoyed their weekend, enjoyed their Super Bowl, um, uh, enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the game. It was not, we know it was not the greatest of game, games, to say the least. But, you know, it's, it, you know, there's always something special about Super Bowl Sunday, um, even in these, uh, amongst the circumstances of what's going on in, uh, in with the pandemic and, and what have you. Um, one of the more uh, shocking results uh, in my lifetime, uh, not from the standpoint of Tampa Bay winning the game, because we knew this, this, this game was basically a coin flip. You know, the, the line was like at three. Uh, these were two loaded teams. Um, Tampa, Bay, Tampa Bay being at home, Tampa Bay being the hot team. Well, both teams are hot, but Tampa Bay especially not losing since the last time they played Kansas City back in uh, week uh, week 10, um, November 29th. So we knew this had potential to be a great game. But, um, I, you know, again, I've been watching, I've watched about 35 Super Bowls. It, one of the more surprising and shocking results in, in my lifetime, uh, Tampa Bay winning in such a decided uh, manner. And really the game, you know, really in essence, the game was over at halftime. Uh, when Tampa, when uh, they got that last touchdown to go up 21-6. Um, we'll get to the Kansas City angle of this. But, uh, you know, I, I think that there is a golden rule in football. And no matter how talented you see a team or how dynamic you see a quarterback like Mahomes and Kelsey and, and Tyreek Hill, the game will always will be and always be won at the line of scrimmage. And that's where this game was decided. Um, Tampa's defensive line completely – just dismantle, dismantle what was already a beat up uh, offensive line in regards to uh, Kansas City with both their tackles being out. We know Eric Fisher was the number one pick in 2013, has been in the Pro Bowl, and more important, and Schwartz, Mitchell Schwartz, uh, people forget about him, he's an all pro. So there was no replacement for those two guys. And, you know, uh, Andy Reid never adjusted to his quarterback being chased seemingly on every play that he dropped back and dropped, dropped back and threw the ball. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's all there is to it. He's, he never, he never, they, they never made Tampa Bay come out there too deep, uh, too deep safety defense uh, coverage. Um, and, you know, you get these teams and again, I, I'll get to Kansas city, but, you know, give all, give Tampa Bay all the credit in the world. They clearly learned their lesson from week 10 Tyreek Hill was not double, was not single covered one time in the game. Not once was he single covered. Was he single covered? Not once. Um, so they they're like, this guy, there's no way that this guy is going to uh beat us. It's just not gonna happen. So you give them a lot, you give um uh, give them all the credit in the world. They clearly were the better prepared team. Um, and again, this, I, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine Saturday about this game and we were trying to, you know, trying to make a decision, you know, trying to go through some of the, what could be the keys and about this game. And I, you know, I simply just said that there was no way that I could see a scenario where Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey could be, could be defended. I just, I just, I just, I just not, did not see that scenario come into pass. Uh, and I thought Andy Reid would have the offensive line prepared well enough to offset, somewhat offset um, Tampa Bay's pass rush. And I, get, I thought Tampa Bay, you know, we, we knew Tampa Bay had an advantage with the defensive line 
first the offensive line, but I thought Andy Reid, being the offensive mind that he is, being, you know, a offensive line guy, per se, in terms of how he builds his teams, going back to even Philadelphia, would have a better, would have a plan uh, if, you know, if things got out of hand and, and mainly, you know, running the football. Similar to, you know, remember, if, you know, if you, if we go back to uh, week six, the Buffalo Bills had, in, you know, invoked a similar plan against uh, Kansas City. Now, Buffalo does not have the defensive personnel um, that uh, Kansas City had, excuse me, that uh, Tampa Bay has. But Buffalo has pretty, you know, they have, some, they have some guys on that side of the ball. They have a decent defense. And they dare Kansas City to run the ball. Kansas City said, okay, we'll run the ball. And Kansas City had like 245 yards of rushing. And Kansas City – Again, could have easily ran the ball in this game, if not to gain yards, but if to just simply protect your quarterback. I mean, Pat, Patrick Mahomes was under, when I mean under siege, yeah, this is, you know, you're talking about historic in terms of how many times he dropped back, in terms of how many pressures he faced. He was, he was hit, hey, forget about the sacks, three sacks. We've seen Super Bowls where a quarterback gets sacked more, but he was hit, you know, eight times. He was pressured 29 times. 29 pressures, which is a record in the Super Bowl. And we've seen some dominant defensive performances over the course of the history of, 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 of these 55 Super Bowls. But again, you know, the... When you're picking, uh, and again, I, I will never make this mistake again. As far as you know, you can get you can you can you can get predictions wrong, um, especially in a one game situation. But you look at what Kansas City was dealing with going into this game. You have I I never trust random going into a game where you have you know the son of your coach who you know gets busted. Uh, and you know, with you know, drunken, drunken driving almost kills a, a, a five year old. You have two girls, you know, you have a four year old and five year old in the hospital. And hopefully, they'll, especially the five year old, especially hopefully they'll be okay. But he, you know, you have that situation going on to the, you know, the son of the head coach. You have, uh, you know, Patrick Mahomes, his toe, which I didn't know it was that serious until, until like, a, you know, uh, the day of the game when they were talking about he's. He definitely will have surgery. He will have surgery uh, this week uh, or sometime in the offseason. No, you know, the two missing offensive linemen, uh, the two tackles, they have to be shuffled three spots in the offensive line. Um, just a lot of things added up. A lot of things added up that went against Kansas City. And despite that, I was like, you know what? They still had that, you know, they still have number 15. They'll be fine. It's not how the NFL works, folks. It's not that's not how that's not how the NFL goes. And you know, again, this is one of the great defensive performances. We'll get to Brady, we'll get to Kansas City, but this is one of the great defensive performances in Super Bowl history when you consider in the offense that Tampa Bay was going against. If you told me I would have took you could have had me for you could have took me for a lot of money if you had told me that we would have made a bet that Kansas City would not score an offensive touchdown. Either I, I might have bet, like, wouldn't have bet the life savings on it, but I, you, you could have got me for a lot of money. There's no way in the world that in a million years, even in defeat, that I ever think, I ever think that that offense would be held with uh, uh, scoreless as far as uh, with no touchdowns. There's no way. There's just no way in the world. Give Bruce Arians an uh, awful lot of credit. Um, I'm going to mention it, and it was this is very important to me, especially you know in these times. Um, three black coaches on his on his staff. You know Todd Bowles, Byron Leftwich, Keith Armstrong, the the uh, special teams coach, and those guys, all of those guys, you know, you know, played a head, you know, played a major part in uh, Tampa Bay winning this game. Um, Tampa Bay, the game plan, we already mentioned defensively, offensively, Tampa Bay goes, you know, punts their first two, two possessions, 
they get the ball in their third possession being after being down 3-0 uh at the Kansas City Eastern field goal and says you know what let's 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 do some ground and pound let's hit them right in the mouth they go three straight runs and they are they obviously they never look back they never look back after that after that uh after that offensively as far as their ability to move the ball hit them right in the mouth and and uh and kept it moving of course you know, and there are only two other defensive performances that I, that would that I would put in the category with this defensive performance, and I'll put it up there on the screen, the 07 Giants and the 2013 Seahawks. The 07 Giants, of course, going against that legendary Patriot offense, the undefeated Patriots, Randy Moss, Tom Brady, Wes Welker. Um, and again, similar to this game, the Giant defensive line just destroyed the offensive line of the Patriots and knocked Brady around. Um, held them and held that offense that averaged like 36, 37 points a game, held that offense to uh, 14 points. And the 2013 Seahawks, when they basically held, uh, you know, held Peyton Manning to one touchdown. And you remember that offense that year, uh, they scored over 600 points that year. Peyton Manning broke the touchdown record, 55 touchdowns. Um, you had, you know, Demarius Thomas, you had Wes Welker. Uh, Julius Thomas uh, was a good player, very good tight end, above average tight end. So those those are only two. Hey, like you can also put you can also put the 2001 Patriots up there too, in terms of what they did to Kurt Warner and Marshall Falk and that you know greatest show on turf offense back in 2001. That or that yeah, back in 2001, that was a you know held held them to 17 points. That, that that was that was one of the great defensive performances of all time. They really knocked the Kurt Warner around, had a pick six. Um, Ty Law should have been the MVP of that game, uh, by the way. Um, but uh, that was a, a, a that was a defensive performance for the ages. No, I'm not putting the Bears or the Ravens up there because those offenses were not comparable to what this Kansas City offense was or that or that uh, 2007 New England. Or 2013 Denver offense was so I, I think yeah that statistically they had been better performance statistically we've seen shutouts and we've seen you know uh, I don't think matter of fact the Ravens in 2000 didn't give up a, didn't give up an offensive touchdown they would touch the touchdown came the giant touchdown came on special teams so in essence it was a shutout but again that giant offense you talk about Kerry Collins and Amani Tumor that, that that was not a great offense uh, that the Giants had in, back in uh, 2000 that 2000 season. Uh, this to me, I, again, I I think this was the greatest defensive performance uh, uh, in the Super Bowl era. I just be honest with you. I like again the hold that guy to hold that those to hold the, that team down to nine points. I thought would would be just virtually um, impossible. Uh, I just didn't. I did not see. That's not how I saw envision Tampa Bay uh, winning um, winning this game. Uh, as far as Tom Brady goes, you know, what can be said that has not been said, um, seven, you know, seven rings, five MVPs, uh, I think without question, uh, the, in modern day sports, the greatest athlete in team sports, I still have to say Bill Russell all time, because Bill Russell did what, had five MVPs and 11 championships. If you people forget about Bill Russell, unfortunately, it just, it's, it's mind boggling, but he, won 11 championships, won eight straight. Uh, I don't care what the era was. I remember that's, that was the era where all where you had great players on every team. People want to mention uh, the, the rounds and the playoff rounds weren't as long. And they want to, you know, mention these ways to kind of take away from it. Yeah, you can, yeah, the, the playoff rounds were not as long. The playoffs were not as long, but the teams that he was going against were better teams. Because uh, every team, every team back then were not as many teams there were not that many NBA teams. Every team had multi had a bunch of Hall of Famers on it. You can go back and you can check it. And he's going against Wilt Chamberlain every single single. Uh, he's going against Wilt Chamberlain. Um, so I, yeah, don't 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 forget about Bill Russell, please. <laughs> that guy, yeah, eleven just eleven championships in thirteen years. But in the modern era, uh, you know, in team sports, it's Tom Brady over Michael Jordan over over LeBron, over, you know, whoever you want, over Wayne Dresky, um, Gretzky, uh, the longevity, 
um, to go to a team that had a losing culture. Uh, and we know Tampa Bay had talent, but just the culture, they had a losing culture. One of the, they're one of the losing, one of the worst franchises in NFL history as far as when had to have to have, have, have the worst per, uh, percentage winning wise in before he got to NFL history. So single-handedly changed the culture. Um, and, uh, you know, and brought a sense of, you know, there was a doubt in the room. He and he played well in this game. I thought the previous two playoff games he hadn't played well, and the defense had really carried him against New Orleans and Green Bay. But I thought he played. I, I thought I thought he was on top of his game, especially in that first half, going 16 for 20 for 140 and the three touchdowns. He didn't. He, in the second half, he didn't have to do anything. He just had to just hand the ball off at that point, which was the smart play. Which was the smart uh, play if you if you're you know if you're Byron Leftwich and you're uh, Bruce Arians in terms of the game plan. And uh, but when he had to make plays, he made them. Obviously, completely, you know, outplayed Mahomes. And uh, listen, he was playing a different game to Mahomes as well. He was he only got he got he got sacked. I think he got sacked once or twice, but he only got pressured when he dropped back twenty nine drop. Only had twenty nine dropbacks and only got pressured four times. So they did not, you know, offensive line did a tremendous job at, at protecting him. Uh, but again, we this is something that we'll never see again. We're, you're not you're not gonna see a guy quarterback go to the Super Bowl ten times. You're not gonna see a quarterback win seven Super Bowls. It's just not going to happen. And I'm just laughing at these, you know, you know, at these um, talking heads who try who just have to try to manufacture these narratives going into this game. Well, Patrick Mahomes has a chance to be the goat if he wins this game, and I'm like. Well, Patrick Mahomes, there's no chance he can be the GOAT after this loss. I'm like, listen, even Patrick Mahomes won this game, per se. Even if he won this game, do you realize that Tom Brady would still have six Super Bowls and Patrick Mahomes would only have, would only have two? That Patrick Mahomes would still have to win four more Super Bowls to, to tie Tom Brady? Which, again, I, again, I don't understand Patrick Mahomes is only 25, but still, you still have to win four more Super Bowls, which is highly... I mean, highly unlikely if you watch the sport of football uh, and, and, and just how the degree of difficulty it is in terms of winning championships and how hard it is. Look how talented you are. So, uh, like, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, this this seals the, the go to the greatest of all time conversation. Okay, that that's a hell of an observa observation to me. Like, that, that conversation probably was, was sealed even before this game transpired that one guy has six Super Bowls and 10 Super Bowl appearances. It's going to have every uh, passing record known to mankind, but 10 Super Bowls. <laughs> so, you know, and again, again, we, again, we have to find something to talk about for two weeks. And, but it, it, some of these stories, some of these narratives uh, were just, it was like, come on, what, what are we talking about? And I'll get to another one in regards to, um, in regards to Brady and Belichick as well. Um, so nothing left to be said about Tom Brady and what um, what he's accomplished. It, again, it speaks for himself. And he, I thought Tampa Bay would be a playoff team. I thought they. I, 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 last year, if you watched Tampa Bay, they had a lot of talent defensively. They were they were they played. They were they were a good defensive team last year. The difference only. Only thing that kept them and held them, you know, held them back course was the turnovers. He had a quarterback that could not protect the football, you know, if his life depended on it. In, in terms of Jameis Winston, you bring in a guy who's going, who's not, who we know is not going to turn over the football, and you bring in a guy with a, a championship pedigree, and he gets guys, you know, whether it's Leonard Fournette, whether it's Gronkowski who had a big game, Antonio Brown who caught a touchdown pass. He brings in, gets those guys to come in. And you have enough veterans uh, mixed, in, mixed in with the young talent. It was a perfect mix. Everything went right for them as far as, uh, you know, having the game at home, uh, a NFC that was weakened, that was weakened towards the end of the season. Seattle not as good. New Orleans, you know, kind of fell apart. And, you know, they took it, they seized the moment and took advantage of it. And we're playing the best football out of any team in, in, uh, in the league. Uh, going down the stretch, along with Buffalo and Kansas City, and and you know they deserve to be Super Bowl champs. There's no two ways about it. They were the most complete team in football this year, especially in the back half of the season, going to December, January, December and January, 
going uh, into the playoffs, and they absolutely did it the hard way going on the road. And despite, I understand on the road doesn't look like what it what it did, what it has traditionally looked like in terms of no fans. I understand that. But they, you still, you know, to go to Green, you know, to go to New Orleans and Green Bay back-to-back, that's hard, and especially the Green Bay game. Because I, I thought the Green, I thought Green Bay was going to win that game. And Green Bay probably is kicking themselves right now uh, after watching this result uh, in the Super Bowl as well. But, uh, you know, Tampa Bay deserves it. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going crazy about the officiating. Uh, let, let me tell you something. I had more of, of a problem with officiating the FC championship uh, where I thought Green Bay got a bad whistle. But still, still no excuses. Green Bay still probably, you know, had opportunities to win that game. Kansas City, no, Kansas City, uh, the guys, you know, the guys were, you know, did, for the most part, those penalties were, those were penalties. I mean, with the exception of the, the Tyrone Math- Matthew, Matthew hold, uh, on Gronk, I think it was on Gronk, and when the pass was uncatchable in the end zone, that was a bad one. But they, you know, you're gonna get listen. As far as fo- football is, you know, when you when you're talking about football, you have to deal with adversity in football. That's all. You might get a bad whistle in a game. You might lose uh, some players to injury. That's part of that's part of being a championship team. And if Kansas City wants to get to become a dynasty, you gotta be. Everything's not gonna be perfect. Uh, you know, things you're going to have injuries, you're going to have bad calls, you're going to have, you know, games where you don't play well. That's that's a part of, it's part of football. That's just all there is to it. It's a part of football. So I, I don't have any, I don't feel sorry for Kansas City whatsoever. Uh, they got their asses kicked. It's just that simple. They got their asses kicked up and down the field and they got dominated in this game. They're absolutely dominated. As far as the, you know, get to as far as the Brady Belichick thing. Uh, again, we don't need to create narratives to further, you know, elevate a particular a, a person. Like like Tom Brady doesn't need help being elevated to. He's already the greatest quarterback. Already, arguably the greatest athlete in team sports. He doesn't need any more elevation. Um, by shitting on Bill Belichick. Some of the stuff I've heard in regards to Bill Belichick is insane. Like Bill Belichick, <laughs> Bill Belichick is one of the greatest coaches of all time. They're on the Mount Rushmore of, of coaches, period. That's, that's all there is to it. Like, there's no, you can't say, like, now, you want to knock Bill Belichick, the general manager? Okay, sure. He hasn't, he has, he has not, he, he's, he has not been a good general manager over, over the past five years. And if you want to say, and I, I don't think that saying that Tom Brady is uh, was a was a bigger reason why New England won than Bill Belichick is breaking news. I don't I didn't need this game for me to to figure that out because in professional sports, uh, in, in particular in professional sports, you're always going to take the superstar, the transcendent, the great great player. Over a great coach, I've seen I, I've seen teams win championships with okay coaches and great talent. I don't you don't see you don't see bad you don't see great coaches win championships with with okay to mediocre talent. It just doesn't happen. Like I watched Barry Switzer win the Super Bowl with the Cowboys in '96 in '95 season. Barry Switzer is not a great NFL coach. He was a great college coach. He was a he was a mediocre NFL coach. He was not a great coach to say the least. Gary Kubiak has a has a Super Bowl. Not a great coach, NFL coach. You know, Paul Westhead has an NBA championship. So I've seen this. I, I, I've seen it. I've seen average to mediocre, mediocre coaches win championships with great talent. So to say that, um, to say that, um, yeah, it was it was Brady. Like, like no shit. Like I mean, and again. They, you know, they did it together. So you want to say whatever, you know, you want to say it's 51% Brady, 49% Belichick. Okay, however you want to cut it, but they they still did it together. Like they, that still was a was was the best quarterback coach marriage in the history of professional uh, of, of football, and probably the best player coach marriage as far as success, and maybe in the history of sports. Maybe you want to go R back and Russell outside of R back and Russell.
you know, I, again, I, again, some of the stuff that, 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 that I had uh, read today, I saw on the end, it was just comical. Yeah, Brady is the system. Yeah, yeah. I mean, great players are, yeah, uh, transcendent great players. When you get to Brady's level of play and, and yeah, you, you, are, you are the system. Yeah, okay. And this idea that, again, well, Brady was, people would say Brady was a system quarterback. Who, who in their right mind would, who, who in their right mind watched Tom Brady in New England and thought he was a system quarterback? This is, what I'm talking, this is what I'm talking about with these dumbass, these dumbass narratives that are created to push a, a guy who doesn't need to be pushed in terms of his status as an all-time great or as a legendary player. Yeah, we already know Brady's an icon, is a legend, a whole legend. Yeah, nobody ever made right mind ever thought Brady was a system quarterback. Who, what, who, who, again, if, if anybody ever approached you and approached me, and said that, I would immediately end the conversation. Like, yo, we just can't talk about sports. This is, hey, it might be a, I might be a cool, might be a decent person otherwise, but we just can't talk about sports. This is, this is just a dumb, it makes, the statement just makes no sense. And, and by the way, Belichick didn't have a system. Doesn't have a system. In terms of, they, they changed their game plan up every week. Period. Yeah, it, it was no Belichick system. You got the per, you have a you got a perfect marriage in terms of a quarterback who was driven to be the best and a quarterback who played, who you know, who wanted to play forever versus a coach who was obsessed with football. Those guys combined and they won six Super Bowl, six championships in twenty years, and something that will probably that will more than likely never be matched. Um, probably will never be matched uh, moving forward. And you want to criticize Brady, Belichick for letting Brady go? Okay, but no, but there were a number of other teams that thought Brady was done as well. There were a number of teams. The Brady, the Brady, the Brady market was not hot. You had Tampa Bay and the Chargers were the only teams that wanted Tom Brady in the offseason. So it wasn't just Belichick that thought Brady that thought Brady was, was done or what that thought Brady was not at a, you know, couldn't perform at this level anymore. But again, I, you know, you're not as a, you are always going to take the, the legendary player or the great, great player over a great coach. I like that goes without saying in sports, it, it absolutely goes without saying yes. I'd rather have Tim Duncan on my team than Greg Popovich. No draft. I'll take Greg Popovich. I got to take Tim Duncan. I'm taking Tim Duncan. I'll take Michael Jordan. I'll take Phil Jackson. I'm taking Michael Jordan. Of course. I, I don't know why this has ever even been a debate. So, you know. But again, people have have to have some something to talk about. But again, it's it's, it's not even it's one of those things where you just you just say, okay, sure, it's like I, yeah, it's just a dumb. You say I, I don't like dumb narratives. You know, I like narratives, but I just don't like dumb narratives. Okay, what happened to the Chiefs? So, you know, I, I was thinking about the Chiefs, and I was thinking about the St. Louis Rams. Well, now the Los Angeles Rams, but back then when they were the St. Louis Rams, great show on turf. Um, again, how the, it was talking to Rob Sapp. We were just discussing greatest offenses of all time. And um, we had, I had, who did I have number one? I think I had, I, I, said, I said that this Chiefs offense was the top three offenses of all time. I think I had San Francisco, I, I think I had San Francisco, the Rams and the Chiefs in that order. Yeah, I think I had San Francisco, the Rams and the Chiefs in that order. So, you know, the Chiefs, it's gonna be interesting with the Chiefs because we look at that, they've had a three year run now that's similar to what the Rams had from 99 to 2001. So from 99 to 2001, the Rams won, um, the Rams won us one, one Super Bowl, they went to two Super Bowls, um, 
and they, of course, they lost a they lost a Super Bowl um, to to New England in that 2001 season, which 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 in in effect ended that little mini run that they had. I can't even call it a dynasty because they didn't win more than one championship, but that little mini run. That's not going to happen to Kansas City per se because Kansas City is 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 younger at uh, at a number of key positions, and especially more that the most important position area is quarterback. And of course, we know what happened. Kurt Warner had a litany of injuries after that 2001 season that he really didn't recover from until late, till about you know 0, 07, 08, uh, when he when he kind of had that that second revival with the uh, Arizona Cardinals. Of course, led him to. A Super Bowl appearance in the tw- in the 2008 season. Um, that's not going to happen to the Kansas City per se. Um, in terms of what happened to the Rams, but there are some similarities in regards to. You know, you look at the, that Ram team. That Ram team, as great as they were, offensively, and they were one of the most electrifying offenses that you will ever see. They were a heavy, heavy turnover team. I mean, their turn. You look at go back and look at their turnover numbers. It was that's that. I mean, that's how dominant their offense was. That they could over that they could just overcome being one of the worst turnover teams in the league, and they were like like even the MVP year that that Warren and Warner had two thousand one when they were fourteen and two. He had twenty two interceptions. He had twenty two interceptions. They had a year where they had one one of those years where they had forty four turnovers. It's like and, and and still and still made it to a Super Bowl. So they were a high high turnover team. Look at this Kansas City team. This Kansas City team was a it has been a high penalty team over the last three years. The one of the most penalized team, the most penalized team over the last three years cumulatively, over the last three years, the most penalized team in all of football. And you know if you want to become a dynasty and if you're Kansas City if I'm if you're, if you're Andy Reid you have to think think big picture because you know you have to think big picture because getting to the playoffs getting to the conference championships even getting to the Super Bowl is not enough you 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 have to think about winning Super Bowls with the with the, uh, the with the amount of talent that you have with the with the quarterback that you have they've got to you can't to me be a dynasty and be and reach their full potential and make something and make and, and beat yourself. Now they don't they don't turn over the ball a lot, but those penalties, those that has to be cut down considerably. They that has they have to be either bottom half or just somewhere in the middle of the pack as far as the penalties goes. And that, like that that to me again you're trying to be a dynasty. And that was the one thing about the Patriots. The Patriots, for all the games that they won, they didn't lose games. They allowed other teams to beat themselves. And that a lot of a lot of these games are not won in the NFL. Many of these more there are more games that are lost than they are won in the NFL, to be a, if, if that makes sense. I mean, not being able to not being able to line up on side on a field goal that would have made it 10-3. I mean, that's just inexcusable. You go back two years, listen, go back two years ago in the AFC Championship, D4, line up offside when Brady had threw uh, uh, a, a seemingly game clinching interception. Kansas City's in the Super Bowl. Kansas City's back to back. I mean, they would have been back to back last, uh, those, they would have been back to back possibly, possibly. They would have beat the Rams, they would have beat the Rams that year in, in 2018. I mean, that, that cost them a Super Bowl appearance. And again, it doesn't show up in the regular season as much because you go, you know, most of the teams that you, a lot of these teams that you're playing are just not that talented. But when you get to the playoffs, you get to a Super Bowl. You're playing against the best, the best players, the best teams, the best coaching. And if you want to have a sustained, you want to have sustained excellence, excellence as far as winning championships, not a championship, championships, plural. That is something that. That's going to have to be cut down um, considerably moving forward. And I thought, again, I thought about the Rams. You know, the Rams, um, the Rams probably should have one more Super Bowl. The Rams probably should have won that during that three-year stretch. They probably should have won two Super Bowls during that three-year stretch. 
Kansas City, at this, you look at this three year stretch, Kansas City probably should have two Super Bowls. I don't say they should have won all three. It's almost, you know, it's impossible. Nobody's won three straight. But they should have, they should, in this three year stretch, they've had, you know, the best player in football for three years. They've had one of the most talented rosters for three years. They should have about, they should have two Super Bowls in this three year stretch. So uh, I thought the Chiefs, I, I thought that they just got wrapped up. And it, it was, it was you know, and again, it, start, it starts with Andy Reid. It was, it was arrogance. It was arrogance. Like, we are not going to change what we do, even though it, it's not working. We're going to go down. We're going to go down doing what we've been, what we've been doing, doing all season long, which, again, is, you know, when you're getting dominated the way they were getting dominated from line of scrimmage, um, which is a dumb strategy and doesn't make sense, but that's what they that they that's what happened to the Chiefs last night. Um, they were just like, no, we're gonna do what we do, and it, you know if it doesn't work, then we're going that we're going down with the ship. And they went down like the uh, Titanic. They went down hard. And again, it's not like they were not capable of running the ball. Um, uh, of running the ball. I'm not saying they would have went out there and ran for 200 yards like they did against, they did against Buffalo, but you you had to find a way to to keep your quarterback upright. Because I, we've never seen a quarterback on running for his life seemingly on every play uh, like Patrick Mahomes was. But, uh, you know, look at this again. Look at this three-year stretch for the Chiefs. One Super Bowl, two Super Bowl appearances. Uh, probably should have another chance. Probably should have another chip. But, again, the idea that they're done or the idea that, you know, how can they recover? Let, let's, let's calm down on that one. Like, when you have a quarterback of Patrick Mahomes' stature, you will always have a chance. Uh, I think they need to address some of their defense. Uh, I think they need another, need another pass rusher, um, and you know, get a little bit. You know, always, you can always use some use some help in the secondary. But I think that they need to address the front seven with the, uh, the with their defensive line and with, in particular, with their pass rush. They don't no D. They don't you know they miss no Justin Houston, miss a D four. You need multiple guys uh, that uh, can get to the quarterback. You can't just count on can't just count on one guy uh, to be able to get to the quarterback. Now you need multiple guys. Uh, certainly, so certainly a guy like Chris Jones uh, needs some help along that uh, along that defensive line. And uh, again, they, this is a franchise that develops talent, drafts well, so that should not be a problem. And they also keep this in mind about the NFL in the offseason. There are going to be a number of players. Salary cap is going down about twenty million. Uh, there are going to be a number of players who are going to be asked out as far as thinking, as far as getting big contracts. They're not going to get the money that they think they're going to get. That are going to be looking for you know teams that have a chance to win a Super Bowl. So you, you could see a lot of these teams: Green Bay, Tampa, um, Kansas City. Uh, you can see a lot of these teams who have who you know can be championship contenders really stack up. In regards to some of the talent, um, some of the uh, some of these uh, players who are going to get cut, and who are still who still have still have ability and going to get cut, uh, and who or are going to be looking for big money and not going to get the big money, so they can get there's going to be a number of those guys as well. But they should have no trouble reloading with with the uh, with the players that they already have. Um, just again, it was a it, it was just. Everything, everything that could have possibly went wrong for Kansas City went wrong. And just show, it just goes to show you just, just how hard it is to win, you know, to go back to back and just how hard it is to win in the, in the NFL. It's just hard to win in the NFL. I don't care. You, you can have the most talented quarterback in the league. The two most, the, the two most talented quarterbacks in the league both went down in, in regards to Rodgers and Mahomes and Rodgers. They both went down. The NBA, and they have, you know, the generational talent uh, in Mahomes and the, the NFL MVP um, 
in Rogers. So on Friday, you're watching watching the Nets in uh, Toronto play, and you're like, okay, this should be a fun game to watch. Toronto's feisty. The Nets, you know, try you know watching their big three. Lo and behold, we only have a big two because Kevin Durant is not in the lineup. I'm like, okay, it, you know, makes sense. Rest, we're gonna rest his Achilles. Uh, cool, no problem. Then Kevin Durant is on the bench with, as you can see, with no mask on. So I'm like, hmm, there's some something strange here. So then we hear the fact that Kevin Durant um, apparently was in close contact with somebody who had a in with somebody with a member of the net staff that had a inconclusive uh, COVID test. Okay. I've heard this story before in sports in regards in, in regards to allowing a player uh, to play with an inconclusive test uh, who had been in contact with somebody with an inconclusive test. So the test comes back um, inconclusive and he's allowed to play for the end of the first quarter through through the latter part of the third quarter. And then we find out that the test comes back uh, positive and he gets pulled um, and he gets pulled. And of course, he will have to quarantine until uh, for, for this entire week. He'll be back for, you know, surprise, surprise. He'll be back for the Warriors game uh, next Saturday night. So, and by the way, the Nets were the Nets in Toronto. The Nets were allowed to play. Toronto, uh, Toronto, has been allowed to play. Which I again, I don't understand what the NBA, what the NBA is doing with with COVID and the protocols. They're, they're looking NFL like in terms of how they're dealing with this. I, I don't understand how the Nets were allowed to travel and play Philadelphia that, that next day. I don't understand how Toronto is not having to quarantine for a couple games. Uh, because Kevin Durant was on was on the floor with the with his teammates and was on the floor for about two quarters in the game and was in close contact with all those players uh, on the floor, in particular his own teammates. So I, I don't understand what the NBA is doing in regards to this. This is a horrible look for the NBA. And then on top of it, like the like the NBA when it's come, it, the NBA handled COVID as well as you can possibly handle it with the but with the bubble. I gave them all the credit in the world, per se, and deservedly so. How they've handled COVID since the season has started and continue to handle it has been, and, and continue to mishandle it, has been mind-boggling to say the least. Uh, on one hand, you're, you're trying to crack down on players um, in regards to, hey, you got to wear a mask on the bench, K95, you know, stay out of the clubs. But on the other hand, you're saying we're still going to have All Star Weekend, okay, in Atlanta, out of all, which is one of the most open states in the country right now, as regards to not wearing masks in regards to clubs and, and, and indoor venues. Like Atlanta, Florida is 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 wide open, wide open uh, in, uh, in, um, during this during this pandemic. So again, I, I just don't like the NBA. Uh, has completely just mishandled this uh, over the course of the season. Uh, the situation with Durant was just a, like you can't. It, it was a, a horrible look for the NBA. Like to me, it's very simple. If a guy comes in close contact with somebody with a who was in, with an inconclusive test, I'm waiting for the results of that test to come back until he steps out on the floor. If the results don't come back, then he just doesn't play that night. It's just that simple. Uh, we saw this in the World Series with Justin with Justin Turner. Justin Turner was allowed to play despite coming in contact with somebody with an inconclusive. Well, Justin Turner had a had a you know Justin Turner was actually worse because he actually had an inconclusive test and was allowed to play, and then they came back positive, so he gets pulled and then came back to celebrate on with his teammates um, after they won after they won the World Series. So yeah, Justin Turner was actually was actually worse. When you think about it, but very, but, but worse, but similar to uh, this Kevin Durant uh, situation. But again, I, again, I, I don't. It's not that hard. You, a guy has an in, a inconclusive test. You sit him until that test comes back negative. If it doesn't come back negative, and if, the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the 
the results don't come back, then he just sits in that particular game. That's it. To me, I, I look at inconclusive as the same if I would look as look at po- positive. And I don't understand why this is this is not that this is not hard. It's not hard at all. So um, you know, the NBA is going to, again, the NBA is going to have to, you know, do something that's going to, it's going to fix this situation from that standpoint. Yeah, like you have to change that, that aspect of the protocol moving forward. Like you can't have, to, you can't have the situation or the, or, or the season will not finish. Cause I like Kevin Durant could have got like, you know, I know he tested negative, but again, you, you, you could be asymptomatic as well. So, you know, it, you want to play it. You want to play it safe when it comes to this because it could, it could spread so easily. But again, I, the, the NBA just completely mismanaged and mishandled this situation. And again, and to watch this in real time was uh, it, it was eerie to watch this happen in real time. To watch this in real time was like what? Like what are they doing? Like what? What's going on here? So again, Paul Bullock from the NBA. We'll see if they can get it right uh, moving forward. Uh, not too many real thoughts. Uh, we've flushed out the Super Bowl. Um, very interesting to see what happens with all these quarterbacks. Uh, you hear Wentz could be on the move. Um, Wentz could be on the move this week in a possible Foles reunion, which I, you know, it's sure. I mean, I, I listen. You, you hit lightning in a bottle once. Let's let's not put uh, let's not push it. Let's not like this. Like if Nick Foles is not is certainly not the answer. But uh, again, that 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 franchise has some issues in regards to their front office right now in Philadelphia. Um, Houston says it's not going. They're not going to trade Watson. Uh, so we're going to see a game of chicken between Watson. And the organization, and and by the way, which Watson will win if he's willing to sit out the season. By the way, so I, I I think, you know, if you're Watson, don't go back on your word now. Um, uh, you know, sit out the season. It's just it's just that simple. Sit out the season. Uh, and by and by the way, Houston would be insane. You know, there are a number of like teams will be willing to give up a a a a Brinks truck of assets and players to get Watson. I mean, what Miami, what you can get from Miami with, I mean, you can get two first round picks from Miami that they have both their first round picks this year and Tua more than likely to get Watson, which would give you Tua and three first round picks this year. You'd be insane not to take that package. And there are a number of teams that would be willing to give up any and everything to get, uh, to get Deshaun Watson. So, I, I do. I do expect that Deshaun Watson will be traded in the offseason. I don't think it will reach the point where he's the where his hand is forced to where he will um, to where he will uh, sit out a season. To where he will sit out the season. Um, so yeah, that Duke, North Carolina. I mean, how far have the mighty have fallen to where you know I'm during when the Duke I, at the Duke North Carolina game. I watched the second half of the game. Uh, was in the gym. For the first half, uh, and watched the second half in the gym as well. Did a workout the first half, and you know was on the was on the stationary bike in the second half, and you know felt pretty good. Uh, you know, even though we know Duke is in Duke, this Duke team probably is going to miss the NCAA tournament this year. Uh, North Carolina will squeak in, but neither but it's not a factor. And of course, North Carolina probably knows that they're not a factor because two of their players were caught on tape celebrating uh, with no mask on. And which led to the postponement of their game tonight against Miami, Miami of Florida. So, you know, I'm not mad. This, this, this is what 18 to 20 year old kids do. I even upset at them. It's not they're not like professionals. So I, I expect more out of professional athletes who are getting paid millions of dollars. These, this is what kids do. They're 18 years old, both or 18, 19 years old. Bangkok and Deron uh, Sharp, uh, both. You know, so yeah, this is what kids do. This is college kids. They on a party. Duke, North Carolina first, their first Duke, North Carolina, well, not their first, because Bangkok played against North Carolina last year, but their first, uh, you know, a big win against Duke, their rival, you know, what do you expect? Um, 
So you still have uh, Gonzaga and, and Baylor who are still undefeated, and seemingly to be seemingly those two teams, unless COVID something happens with COVID, which is always possible, are on a collision course to meet in the national championship. I would be very surprised again. Or let's let's say everything goes somewhat normal with COVID, and they don't miss have any miss have any players taken out because they, I'll be sort of shocked. We don't have a Gonzaga Baylor national championship. That those two teams are when I mean heads and shoulders above everybody else. It's not even like it's they are absolute heads and shoulders above anybody else in college basketball uh this season. That's gonna wrap it up for this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast. I will see you later on in the week. I'm out. And as always, oh, as always, you can you uh you can go to my you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, now I'm out.